What's up, what's up? Ren's here, Vince there. This is Chat Combat coming at you. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to the first episode of Combat Chat. I'm here Numero with Ren. So yeah, we're very excited. Debut, our pilot. Hopefully we fly, uh, we fly very well. Nothing wrong with crashing and burning, but we're here to soar and make it look good. And hopefully talk about some things that you guys think it's interesting about MMA, combat, self-defense. Oh, absolutely. And things like that. Yeah, I mean, like, I was looking at some stuff online. I was looking at some stuff from the past. I tell you what, man, um, combat sports and entertainment has come a long way. It's like, it, um, it you, a long way. Oh, absolutely. Like, um, I used to watch WWE when I was a kid, but then um, one time I was watching UFC by accident. I was like, where are the chairs? Where are the tables? And I was like blown away about how interesting it was to see that split difference. And after I saw Ultimate Fighter One, I was like hooked. But while I was doing that, oh yeah, but when I was doing that, um, I guess you can call it down the rabbit hole for that. I kind of stumbled across a few uh, more nostalgic things. I don't yeah. know if you ever seen it, but like um, celebrity boxing events. That's horrible. Oh, they're In so my bad. Opinion. Like before oh, YouTube. <laughs> Before Luckily, we share the same opinion on this. No, I agree, man. Like, um, you can never truly appreciate true technique until you see people that think, "Oh, yeah, I can throw on headgear and boxing gloves. I can, I can do some boxing." No, no. But you know like, what the problem? I, I, I haven't. I don't have a problem uh, with celebrity boxing in this in the sense of if it, it's entertainment some people like to watch it some people like i mean it brings uh money and it brings more eyes to the sport oh yeah in my opinion the biggest problem with it is that uh real athletes they they are struggling to make it to the top and earn a living they are uh you know they, they don't get the same attention as these celebrities oh bingo man right on the dot with that but I will be honest, it was entertaining to watch um, one particular fight or a boxing event. It was, um, you know who Vanilla Ice is? Yeah, I know. Stop, collaborate, and listen. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> yeah, that guy. But anyway, um, there's also this other guy, Todd Bridges. They, uh, he's from this show, um, Different Strokes. You know, what you talking yeah. about, Willis? I saw that boxing match, and I was like, wow. It wasn't Vanilla that Ice bad. Sucks. It was like an amateur fight. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, um... I got hand it to Todd Bridges. He definitely handled it. That was a good um that was a good performance on his end. If only uh vanilla ice could keep up. You know, but to be completely honest, if you see the Logan Paul versus uh versus you know, versus KSI fight. Jesus, Logan, I did see that one. Logan Paul wasn't that bad at boxing. He I mean he did have have done better. he could have done better, but for his first you know, it's it's like an amateur boxing match. It 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 is a it's a f way smaller crowd. It was like a professional boxing match, the amount of people that were. Indeed. In. So, to have that amount of stress in your first boxing match, I mean, he didn't do that bad, in my opinion. I mean, I don't like the action that he, that he did on YouTube. I don't like the guy at all, in my opinion. But hey, 100% with you on that one. I have to be honest. He, if he started out boxing sooner, you know, when he was younger... He could have mm -hmm. he could have become a boxer. I mean, he has an, he he is an athlete. He can wrestle for sure too. Actually, yeah, I did see that video of him and uh, Paulo Costa. That was actually pretty interesting. He's a great he scrambler. Fare, oh yeah, he didn't fare well with the boxing with uh, Paulo Costa. He got himself like lit up. Yeah, but he handled himself pretty well for um, the size. Of, like I don't know how, how big the size difference is between those two, but it's um, not I think, too big. Uh, but it's similar. like fifteen pounds. In, I think probably twenty, maybe. I mean, this is assuming that um, Paulo Costa was probably walking around like um, at a competition weight. He could have been a little bit heavier than what he yeah, really walked around after, like um, when he's weighing in. But Paulo Costa is like a big middleweight. Jesus, God. He's a big middleweight. <laughs> like, I feel bad for the poor person that's like a Johnny Hendricks fight. I felt bad for Johnny Hendricks. Like, nope. Nope. There's nothing you could do against this guy. That's I wouldn't want to be locked in a cage with that guy. Nope. <laughs> Not without years of training and mental preparation. Like, okay, if he gets me here, I'm gonna go there. Since we're talking he gets about me like this, yeah. But since we're talking about scary guys, what do you think of Mike Tyson coming back to boxing for a charity um, event? Oh, he's doing a charity event. Okay, that makes way yeah, more it's a sense. Event. Um, uh, who's he taking on? That uh, one guy who is also retired, that a boxer. 
He's also in his 50s. He was on Joe Rogan's show about a year ago. They were already talking okay. about it. I think I know who you're talking about. I can't draw the name from uh, memory. I can look it up in a moment. My, my mind that's... sucks from boxing names. I'm sorry. I only know Muhammad no, Ali, no, no problem. Triple G, uh, you know, Mike Tyson, of course. But MMA is where my head is at. When no, I feel it. that, man. Absolutely. I tell you what, I think that's uh, really spectacular, Mike Tyson. It's good to see him getting back into it. Like, I know he had a period of time where – after his retirement, he was like, I don't even want to think about boxing. I don't even <laughs> want to touch the bag. I don't want to do this or that or anything. But to, completely, to be completely <laughs> honest, I mean, if you're a guy like that, that's scary. Even, even most professional fighters are scared of that guy. And, I mean, he, he always says that he is hungry uh, for fighting. If he starts training again and he, his heart starts pumping again, then he wants to go in there. And he knows that, that that wasn't what he wanted for a, a, a while. No, I hear that, man. Like, um, he fell on some hard times. I actually blame that a lot on, like, one second. Just turning something off in the background. Forgot that was even on, had the headphones on. Hopefully that wasn't really heard too, too much. Oh, you could hear it, but it wasn't too bad. That's good news. Just a little background noise. Hopefully no one catches on what it was. It was just YouTube. Yeah, I know. Which will hopefully be where we go next. But, um... <laughs> You know, like uh, Mike Tyson, he fell on some pretty interesting hard times. Like, you know, after his uh, like uh, his manager trainer, he passed away. I think that was kind of like the beginning of his like true downfall. Yeah, he had some public issues with like going to jail or prison, but it, uh, he bounced back really well from that. But after his trainer died, he kind of fell onto like some unsteady grounds, in my opinion. But totally, seeing him come back, I'm totally on board with you in that one. It's, but like um sensing him come back man like i'm pretty amped up for it i was a little skeptical at first if he was going into like the actual ring to like fight for championships no he's but for still, charity i, I don't I, i'm not saying that he couldn't be i think he could beat the top 10 guys you know in boxing i think he could at least beat the 10th guy but it wouldn't be healthy for his body anymore i mean you get mm, it's, if it's heavyweight what we're, what we're talking about so it's like you get hit so hard in the head. I mean, he's over 50 now, so. No, I hear that for sure, man. Like, um, a lot of people like to use the analogy, you know, the body's a temple, the temple kind of starts deteriorating for athletes and, like, combat athletes especially. I like to think yeah. of it as um, there's, like, two kind of cars that come to mind for us, a hobby set. Like, uh, there's the sports cars, and then there's, like, the big trucks that can haul weight really well. Do you want to train, like, a sports car, or do you want to train, like, um, a heavy truck, duty yeah. car yeah you know, which is kind of like one vehicle you only have one vehicle in this life you gotta be exactly, healthy man. with it i mean yeah, and I even a... even uh, even if you're young i mean i'm only 20 but my knee also i have a knee issue and it's like i gave it some rest but i can still feel it so i'm now i'm gonna check it out let it checking uh, out again but i mean it's not that call yeah but i mean it's same with your bicep tear how is that doing Oh, it's doing very well. I just did some uh, bicep curls, uh, palm down, palm up, and then um, kind of like, I guess you call it like, uh, where do you call that curl? Like hammer curl, I guess? Yeah, it's a hammer curl. Yeah, I do a lot of like uh, bicep activities now. I've actually been getting into a lot of like um, just free weight exercises. It's really nice. I like, like free um, weights way better for fighting. Oh, absolutely. Than, Plus, than, because you, you develop those stabilize, stabilize of, uh, you know, the, those muscles that keep you stable. You develop the, the, them way more. So when you're actually in the ring, you have those. You just have that little advantage when you go for a double leg or something like that. Oh, 100%, man. Like, coordination is a very big deal. Yeah. In con like, it's a very big deal in everything, to be honest. You balance, have, like, a balance proper so balance and calibration and coordination for walking. You'll be falling down all the time. Yeah, you're and right. Then if you amplify, and then if you amplify that by a very specific, like, southpaw or orthodox stance in the ring or the mat or in the cage – you'll be falling down way more often. Like, a lot of fighters, they have really good balance. Yeah, really good. Especially guys like Wonderboy or something, someone I wanted to talk about, Shirker Sean O'Malley. Oh, man. What do you think of him? <laughs> I feel like he's getting kind of gimmicky now. I feel like he was... Um, I was really looking at him like, man, he's doing good. But then he's, like, got the hair thing going, the face tattoos. I'm like, 
God, don't do this to yourself, man. Don't I, become... I like fighters to look like fighters. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say no, it. No, I agree I, with you, man. I, agree I mean, you. The, these, these are supposed to be the toughest guys in the world, especially in the UFC. And it's a little bit of, yeah, you're looking yeah, like, like a clown. It's very gimmicky, in my opinion. Yeah. Like, um, I feel like some fighters rely on image rather than talent. Like, um, I think of a few of them off the top of the head. Like, uh, Mike Perry, he's a good example. Yeah. He's very much an image person, in my opinion. Like, yeah, he's got some stand-up talent in the ring. Don't get me wrong. For example. But I don't feel like he really portrays himself in a manner that people talk about his fighting as much as they talk about his image. But, and I feel like if Sh uh, Sugar Sean O'Malley keeps the way he's going, it, people are going to recognize him more for his antics outside of the octagon. Like, oh, yeah. man, do you hear about Sugar Sean O'Malley? Oh, about his knockout? It's like, no, about his hair, about his face tattoo. Yeah. It's the same with McGregor. It's the same with McGregor. I mean, he also got big because he, uh, you know, he, he because the things, the trash talking, the things that he did outside of the ring, that made him famous. That made made him big. Of course, people oh, like yeah. to watch him fight, especially because he's a stand up fighter. You know, most casual fans also like that more than the grappling department. But very true. You know, it's like guys like that get popular really, really fast, but. The most, uh, you know, most true fans don't like those guys. No, I agree with that, man. Like, um, I used, I'll, I'm actually guilty. I used to be one of those casual fans that were like, why are they on the ground? This is bullshit. Stand them up. They need to start throwing punches, yeah. throwing kicks. But, you know, the further you go into it, you realize there's levels to the game. Like, um, it's almost like Jenga. No one wants to play the game Jenga by just having, like, the first three moves and it just topples, like, yes, I win. It's like, you want to get further and further along and see how much more crazy you can get. Yeah. And, totally uh, the element of like, uh, in the, um, addition of grappling, the clench, like you can't really clench in boxing. Like no, uh, as soon as you clench for more than like four or five seconds, they break it up. And it's like, don't do that again. You'll get penalized a point or something like that. Yeah, but to be honest, people that don't like the grappling, I mean, go watch glory kickboxing, you know, Rico Fair, who yeah. that's, that's, that's a Dutch guy. Uh, he's the heavyweight champion in glory, but then they really have great fights. I mean, if you like, it, it's like boxing with kicks. I mean, if you like that, that <laughs> go watch those fights if you like them. But in MMA, I mean, grappling is, in my opinion, the most important part of MMA. If you don't, if you oh, don't yeah, know how to grapple, you're going to be taken down, submitted, or worse, getting ground upon it. No, 100% agree. And that's been like proven from UFC 1 to almost like UFC... Um... I want to say 13, like when people started integrating little bits of martial arts, like um, I got to say like maybe Frank Shamrock is probably like yeah. the best example of the original mixed martial artist. Like he included striking, the clinch, grappling, um, wrestling. He I included disagree. a lot of aspects. I don't disagree. I, I think I don't disagree. I think you're right in that, but always. You know, Bruce Lee, I don't want to, he's not the god that people made him to be, but he, in my mind, he also was one of the most, the original mixed martial artists because he oh, also absolutely. used he the different, architects. Yeah, I mean, he even trained with, your, you know, uh, uh, the, famous judo, the famous judo guy. Oh, Gene LaBelle, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Gene LaBelle, that, that's the guy. You know, he also <laughs> trained with him because he thought, yeah, he, he, he thought, you know, if you try to grapple with me, I'm just going to kick the shit out of you. I'm just going to box your face off. But then he tr got thrown up in, on the ground, and then he uh, implemented judo in what uh, what was later going to be known as, uh, you know, Jeet Kune Do. No, absolutely, man. I agree with that. Like, um, I, w I don't know if I'd ever call Bruce uh, Lee, like, the godfather of MMA, but I would definitely call him the architect yeah he so definitely cool. like he definitely put pieces together that was like not like um like jeet kundo is is like the refinement of martial arts is taking away the pieces that don't work and using the pieces that do yeah. work but you know like that's if, also a problem because some guys uh they overuse that because you know you do you know shane face from fight tips uh yes yeah i don't um, watch him too too often but i know but he's a famous he's a famous youtuber and but when he, he always uh, tells the story when he uh, switched from Taekwondo to Muay Thai, they tried to get rid of his snap kicks. But later on, uh, he got, when he got to spar with Muay Thai guys, they were surprised by his snap kicks, especially the head kicks. You know, they are faster when it has a snap to it than the regular roundhouse kick to the head from Muay Thai. Oh, yeah. You know, I like snap kicks myself. Those things, I, I, th I always say, 
you need to have <laughs> boxing footwork, uh, takedowns and takedown defense from wrestling, submission from jiu-jitsu, you know, and, uh -huh. Muay Thai, and Muay Thai skills for blocking leg kicks, you know, and if you want to, you can use those kicks if, uh, for your own. But, you know, the oh, kicking absolutely. defense from Muay Thai. And after you have those four base martial arts, in my opinion, you can throw in some things like Taekwondo, karate footwork, karate kicks, you know, spinning kicks, maybe reverse oh. punches, spinning back fist. But, you know, in 100%. my mind, you always need those base uh, martial arts. Otherwise, you, you, won't, uh, you won't make it in uh, MMA. Oh, 100%, man. Like, um, like you were saying, like, it's a lot of levels. Like, yes. before you learn how to do the fancy stuff, you got to learn how to do the meat and potatoes. Yeah. Like, um, yeah, I don't want to use, like, a lot of cooking analogies. I used to do cooking kind of like as a profession. I used to be a chef nice. in a restaurant. Not a chef, but I was, like, one of the people in the background, like, here's the potatoes for your meat. <laughs> but, like, um, you know, before you do, like, um, a very big fancy recipe that you expect to see on, like, a Gordon Ramsay menu, you kind of start with, like, very basic things and work your way up. You know, like, you learn how to make meat and potatoes before you learn how to make au gratin and um, filet mignon. I get what you're saying, indeed. But that's the same with uh, if people say, if some people say you can't use karate in MMA. Some people say, yeah, karate is the only thing you need for fighting. But if you're real, really honest, if you look at a guy like Wonderboy, he is a prime example of karate that can be worked, uh, you, you know, that you can use karate in MMA and in real fighting. But the thing is, he also knows everything else. He also knows his takedown defense. He, he wrestles all day. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to use that fancy footwork that he's using because he wouldn't be. Oh, he absolutely. If he doesn't know takedown defense, that's also the problem with most traditional martial artists. They don't know takedown defense. Oh, 100%, man. Like, there are two types of, like, uh, there are a few kinds of strikers out there. And then there's, like, kind of two categories of strikers in mixed martial arts. There's, like, those that are really comfortable with the ground that they don't have to worry about getting taken down. And then there's kind of, like, those um, strikers that, they're like, okay, I don't want to get taken down. I'm going to just fight very tentatively. Yeah, but the problem with that is if, you, if you're that worried about the takedown, you're not going to be able to strike very well. Because oh, be, absolutely. And that, that's why a guy like Donald Cerrone always just charges forward. You know, he, he's a slow starter, but he will pressure fight you in the later rounds because he's not afraid to be taken down. His guard is amazing. Oh, man, he's he made a time and time again. He's, what did you say? Sorry. Oh, yeah. He's proven that, like, a lot of times. Like, yeah. um, Donald Cerrone is, like, phenomenal on the ground. Like, he's no um, Hoist Gracie, but he's no slouch either. No, and his takedowns also. I like his takedowns because they're more like, you know, body lock takedowns. He doesn't shoot in for the mm -hmm. double leg very often. But it's like he mixes it, it very well with, uh, with his striking. But I don't uh, like that. He has a tra traditional Muay Thai stance in which you don't use that much head movement. And that's why I like the Dutch style a little bit better uh, in terms of head movement because that you learn head movement in uh, the Dutch style of kickboxing. But I like Muay Thai better because you you know you can use elbows in the clinch. Hundred percent. I actually feel that head movement is uh, like very often underutilized at the beginning stage. I'm starting to feel like head movement is one of those things that you should start learning a little bit more sooner than later. Because if you learn how to you know, throw punches and block, you're not really like worrying about the problem about knowing people that can faint and get past your block and hit your heads. Like um, I wasn't very big on head movement myself. And then I was sparring with someone that's very, really proficient in boxing. He's a really good boxer. Holy shit. Like his jab cross is like always oh, nailing me in the freaking head. I'm like, <laughs> okay, what do I got to do now? I know the feeling. <laughs> I once got hit, I, uh, in one of my, before the corona and everything happened, I sparred with a really good kickboxer and that guy threw a head kick. I was like, oh shit, because I, I didn't see it coming at all. <laughs> it, it, nailed, it nailed me and I was on the ground. Just like right over the shoulders, like, where it was, that in, it, it was in my neck. It was like, you know, he, he threw uh, it. Uh, that hurts. It was with his front leg too. You know, he threw a jab. He, he is a southpaw. He threw a jab and I, you know, tried to parry that jab. But then he can ride over the, over the top of that. Oh, uh, that's, that's I really work. like using that one myself, man. Yeah, it's I actually like to, funny. I, like, I like to use it with a cross, you know, throw a cross, but it doesn't mean anything. And then just grab the back of the head and pull them into your head kick. Oh, yeah, 100%, man. 
I actually like really using the um, the jab and then leading that out with that lead kick, like a lead round kick. That's usually pretty Ooh, nice. Oh, that's a nice combination too. So like, when you um, retract the jab, you throw a head kick. Yeah, like I try and bait them almost. Like I'll try and throw the jab constantly. I, I usually stay on southpaw myself. So I'll just keep throwing the jab, throwing the jab, and I'll just wait for their lead hand to kind of react to it. And when that happens, their hand's busy. They can't block that kick as easily. But that doesn't work on my friend who kept boxing me. Like, I kept throwing the jab. He'd throw, like, three punches back. I'm like, Jesus. So I got talking to him after. I'm like, <laughs> how do you keep hitting me in the head, man? He's like, dude, you're, like, very stationary with your head. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, man, your head is here. You should be doing this. I'm like, okay, little movements to get my head off the course of the punch. Okay, I dig that. Especially he still gets well me all the time. In my opinion. Oh, absolutely. Like, um, you know, I'm sure you remember Bradley Scott from uh, yeah. Fight Perfect. Great like, guy. he did a video, like, um, he was doing a video recently, and I think uh, Mike, he's, I see Mike did something about this as well. Like, when you're throwing the punch, you just kind of, like, slightly tilt your head off instead of staying right on the line. Yeah, it's so like, if you, throw, if you throw a punch, <laughs> I always say, some people throw it like this, but, you know, yeah, like this. Yeah, I used to do it that it, way. It's so open. Always behind the shoulder. I'm making yeah. a video on that soon, you know. Always right, but always tuck your head a little bit. Especially yeah, in MMA, because you can slip punches way easier with those small gloves. Yeah, I've been starting to do that myself. Like, um, I try and, I don't try and, like, go totally clenched up. I just try and, like, wait for the right moment. As soon as it just starts going out, then I just start tilting yeah, that, to it. Yeah, that's the best way, indeed, in my opinion, because otherwise you're burning your shoulders out if you're constant, constantly like that. I guess you nope. call that kind of like a Jeet Kune Do tactic. I'm shaving <laughs> off the things that I thought were useful, and now I'm refining them, making yeah. them smoother. <laughs> you can always do that with techniques that you're, that you're not good at. You say, ah, no, they don't work for me. I can just skip them. <laughs> but, you exactly. know, uh, Cain Velasquez, in my opinion, he has the best head movement for MMA because from all the fighters that I've seen, because he... Uh, does never duck punches. He always slip slips them. He's like a little bit like Mike Tyson, but he doesn't roll with punches as well. Because if you have your head too low in MMA, you you will get head kick, especially no, against 100%. a guy like Cerrone. Yeah, he, th like, he times um, those slips. I like Cam Velasquez. I really hope he makes a comeback to MMA soon. I, like I, I heard. You know, I, I heard that um, he kind of like uh, left WWE because of a contract thing. Yeah. That's so why. hopefully that opens up an avenue for, you know, like I got my fingers crossed that he either does like Bellator or like one of the Japanese promotions. I think he would do really well over there. Yeah. Like if he, he comes back to UFC, maybe. there's going to be like the stack division. Because he, he's the prime example of somebody that just uh, torn his own body apart because those gym wars, those, the, that, that uh, hard sparring, I mean, if you watch yeah. the Francis fight, his knee was already blown out before he got hit. He put uh, some weight on it. That, unless he gets some real treatment for it, you know, like stem cell therapy, I don't think he will do well in MMA anymore against people that are at his level. Because his body just doesn't work anymore. Nah, it is a damn shame. He's gone through a lot of, like, injuries, like, between his uh, neck, his back, and his knee. Like, man, it is, like, really upsetting because he was a really good heavyweight fighter in the UFC. Like, in general, I would consider him, like, definitely one of the top five heavyweights that performed between the years of uh, 2011 yeah. and 2017. He definitely, like, he definitely put up and put people down. Yeah, he is one of my favorite <laughs> heavyweights fight fighters ever. Him, St Stipe, uh... yeah, Francis is growing on me. He's yeah. growing on me, but he's still not that though. Yeah, you know, he's a no he's a knockout artist and I appreciate that. But his fights aren't that interesting for me personally. But so some people just like it, the, those knockouts and things like no, that. I can I can kind of feel that. Francis has that like enigma to him where it's like it's a very, very high percent chance that he's gonna win the fight via knockout. And it's gonna be within like almost a minute of that first round, it feels like. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to like. It's kind of like um, it's kind of like the enigma that uh, Mike Tyson has. People liked Mike Tyson, and they're like, "Which round is it going to be? Which uh, minute is it going to be that he's going to knock someone out?" Yeah. And so far, Francis Ngannou, he's he's really been doing it. Like, um, what was the last three fights he had? It was um, Rosenstruck, uh, Alistair Overeem, and 
it was by Davis Lewis. I don't want to count Lewis. Lewis. I don't want to count Lewis. Oh, wait, it was Velasquez. He had Velasquez after um, yeah, Lewis. Yeah, but, you know, Velasquez is in his prime, but just shoot for the double leg over and over again. Oh, 100%. I mean, if you see, if you saw what he did to Brock Lesnar, and Cain Velasquez is, in my opinion, a better wrestler than Stipe. And Stipe oh, is already a, and Stipe is already a great wrestler, but you know, Francis wouldn't have won, in my opinion, if it was in his prime. But, but his body was just torn out. People don't realize how how much of a difference it makes when you get older. You get your you know your vision starts to wear down. It's the same. It's the same with Cowboy. I mean, in his prime, he would have. Uh, won some of the fights that he lost now against Masvidal, for example. Masvidal is a young fighter. You know, he's a really good fighter. And, and to put him against an older guy like Cerrone, who already had those wars, you know, he really had wars fights. He, he didn't have, in oh, yeah. my opinion, Conor McGregor, for example. He had easy fights in the, in the way that he uh, won. He bullies people around. Nate Diaz was the first guy that gave him something back, if you know what I'm saying. Oh, I agree with that, man. On top of that, uh, and like, Donald uh, Cerrone already was... had those, you know, those really tough fights. Yeah, like um, when Cerrone was coming up, he was coming up in a Shark Tank. Like he had a lot of like yeah. worthy adversaries. When Conor McGregor was coming up, you know, I'm not going to shit on um, Conor McGregor too too much. But when he got to the UFC, he was taking on smaller opponents. Like, yeah, he yeah. had some fair share of like lightweight fights during his like you know pre UFC career, but. You know, he came in as a featherweight, and he was a very big yeah. featherweight. You know, like he was yeah. able to muscle people around. I, I don't, I don't shit on the guy because he is an amazing fighter. Don't get me wrong, but I, I mm-hmm. get what you're saying, and I agree with you. Yeah, like um, as soon as he started bumping up the intensity of his competition, in my opinion, like um, Chad Mendes was the first time we got to see like what happens to Conor McGregor if he gets taken down and like whale yeah. on. But on, on the other he hand, came back he, from did, that one. he did. He did. Uh, for, he did fought with a third ACL, if I remember correctly. So, I mean, if your if your knee isn't working correctly, you can't stop the takedowns as well as if it is. That working. is true. But on the other hand, if his ACL was working, would he still have gotten taken down by? He Chad would still Mendes? have gotten taken. I mean, Chen oh, Mendes yeah, is I'm a sure great wrestler. I mean, come on. <clears throat> That's why I already knew that how the Khabib fight was going down. I mean, if he. Oh man, I think we all do that one. <laughs> yeah. About uh, talking about Khabib, how do you think uh, Justin is gonna fight against Khabib? What do you think is gonna be his game plan? I really hope that he keeps refining his tactics. Now, I believe he's at Elevation Fight Team now, so yeah, yeah. that's definitely a that's gonna be a major boost to his striking offense and his striking defense. Like that team really does well with like, um, you know, refining and like really making everything work out for strikers in regards to his wrestling against Khabib. I think that, um, I don't think they're anywhere close to equal. They got two different, totally different styles of wrestling. In my opinion. He can wrestle though. He can. Oh yeah, he can. He's one of the best um, wrestlers Khabib has faced so far. Oh, indeed. Like I feel, um, Khabib is more wrestling oriented. He doesn't want to strike. He just wants to use striking as a means to like get into the takedown, change together and get to the ground. Oh, 100% he can. So, so many people are <clears throat> said that he can't strike for some reason. But, I mean, I saw the fight against Edson Barbosa, and he landed some beautiful uppercuts. But he's just oh, his striking yeah. is super wild because he wants to pressure you against the cage. And then exactly. he can take you down. If you're against, if you're against the cage, he's going to take you down because he's going to use judo, sambo, uh, standard wrestling. You know, he, he's going to use everything mixed with his strength. I mean, come on. He's a scary dude. Oh, 100%. Man. I mean, it's almost um, the opposite of Danny and Maya. Danny and Maya, when he took on Nate Marquardt, he was using a very boxing-heavy style against someone that's who that's uh, more prepped for striking. Like, had Danny and Maya like really engaged for the takedowns more than the entire like striking yeah. offense, I'm pretty sure Danny and Maya would have walked away with a W that time. But he got knocked out cold on his feet. Yeah, totally. But right. but like um, Khabib, like he's a you know, scale of one to ten in the range of striking, I would give him probably like a five. He knows how to throw punches. He knows how to throw kicks and knees and elbows. But is that his bread and butter? No. No. Oh, hell no. Oh. If anything, that's kind of like his saltine and um, well, that's like his cheese and crackers. It's like, yeah, I got cheese and crackers. I'm going to enjoy this. And then it's like, oh, the grapple and the takedown? Yeah. That's something that right I there don't is get. my prime thing. If I were a head coach, 
all the head coaches, everyone that everyone that I uh, hear speaking about is they say, oh yeah, if we get if he tries to take us down, we will do this, we will do that. The, I think don't get to that position in the first place. If you see all, exactly. if you look at all of his fights, Khabib can deal with pressure. You know, he can take a shot. We saw the Edson Barboza fight. He took that head kick like a champ. But I mean, if you pressure Khabib, he will move back. And if you keep doing that, I mean, the first takedown that Khabib uh, tried on Connor it was in the center of the ring. And Connor, you, you know, defended it pretty good. You know, the single mm-hmm. leg that he shot in. But I mean, if you see Khabib hasn't the, ha, doesn't have the best takedowns in the center of the octagon against no, the cage, gets more that's against where the cage. he is dangerous. Yeah. So if you have a guy like Justin we, we, who can strike, you know, we, he, he, he has some real, real power in his hands and he's really fast with combinations. I mean, oh, if, yeah. you have a, if you have a guy like that, keep the pressure on Khabib, keep his back against the cage because that way you have all the space behind you to... Uh, you know, to, to deal with those takedowns. And then you can deal with those takedowns because you can use your foot, footwork. But if you yeah, have your back like, against the cage, Khabib is going to take you down. 100% agree. I actually feel like um, that's going to be the big difference between Khabib versus uh, Gaethje. It's going to be Khabib's grappling versus Justin Gaethje's ability to kind of like keep it standing, scramble. But more importantly, that leg kick that Justin Gaethje is very good with. Like yeah. he has a hell, he has a hell of a leg kick. But in my like, opinion, I, I wouldn't kick against Khabib. I only would use front I kicks mean, and things like that because every kick that you know, every round kick, I don't know, I don't care how hard Khabib is going to be hit with that, he's going to be sticking to that leg. He's just going to grab that leg and run you to the cage. I mean, possibly. I I wouldn't dispute that. Like grapplers, they love grabbing legs. That's for sure, man. It like, was one of GSP's like uh, favorite fav- fav- takedowns. Grab the leg, you know, throw an overhand of a right or a right straight, and then take them down. Hundred percent. But I think what's going to be the big differences with this fight is how hesitant is Justin Gaethje going to be to throw those leg kicks because his hands have gotten much better. He has looked much more um, refined. His like jab is coming along. His cross is coming along. He's no longer throwing those big looping like round punches. Right. Like, he still, has, from, he like, still has the power around. that he had in the beginning. He still ha- oh, yeah. the- But you know that that's like, the thing. That's the thing. I, I think if uh, that's why I would would have wanted to see Tony versus Khabib because Tony has that style. He has that great scrambling style, so he can uh, deal way better with a chain wrestler like Khabib. But he can also fight off. He's the best guy in the UFC to fight off his back, in my opinion. Uh, rest in peace, uh, Ferguson and uh, Nurmagomedov. That would have been a really good fight. But I anticipate never, that would have been. You never know. If, if Justin loses from Khabib, there's no. There's. I see Tony fighting Khabib anyway. I mean, hopefully. I mean, I always. I keep hearing about like Khabib being interested in retiring. Dude, there's been so many UFC stars nowadays that are like, "Oh yeah, I'm retiring. You can strip me from the championship. Just take me off the rankings." It's kind of like a bummer to hear that because a lot of these fighters kind of like they're not peaking yet. They're kind of like at their prime. Like I uh, think, Henry I think Cibudo, Khabib, if, if Khabib wins from Justin, I think he wants to fight George St. Pierre for a super fight and he wants to fight. I would love that. I don't think McGregor gets a rematch if he wins from Justin. If he loses from Justin, I think that it's going to be Justin versus Tony Ferguson or McGregor versus Justin or Justin of um, or a rematch between. Uh, McGregor and uh, Khabib. I mean, this is all kind of assuming that Conor McGregor wants to drop back down to 155. It sounds like he's been like making an interest in like going up a weight class now. I think I think like, he wants um, to beat a double. T- I think he wants to beat Masvidal for sure. I think that's mm-hmm. the fight that he wants to do, to have the baddest motherfucker belt. You know, the BMS belt. <laughs> I think he wants one. And by the way, that that's a really funny belt in my opinion. I love this fight between Diaz and. Uh, and Masvidal. I'm waiting for that rematch. I would love to see that rematch more, yeah. to be honest. And please, guys, let let it be in Las Vegas. With some I don't the, know. You can go with, for the entire like, little the... combat theme playing at Fight Island. Oh, that would be awesome. But I want to see McGregor versus Masvidal better than I want to see uh, McGregor versus Usman. Because versus Usman, it's going to be Tyron, the Tyron Rootley fight all over again. Uh, it's going to be a wrestling clinic for sure, man. 
Like, I don't know how many strikes Kamara Usman will throw standing, but I'm pretty it's sure gonna, he's going to throw a shit ton on the ground. It's going to be double act the movie. <laughs> it's, it's basically going to be the rematch of uh, Kamara. Um, the how can speak? It's basically going to be the rematch of Khabib versus um, Conor McGregor at welterweight, but it's not going to be Khabib playing himself. It's going to be Usman playing Khabib. Yep. Uh, I can see it just happening exactly the same way. But to be honest, I think how weird it sounds, I think uh, McGregor has better cardio at 170 than he had at 145. Um, I'd agree with that. He was because, definitely not having to worry about cutting weight, that's for sure. He definitely looks much stronger now than he did before. Yeah, because many people, you know, they say against the fight against Nate Diaz, you know, when he was at 170, but that was different. He, he just bulked up, but he didn't. Uh, now he has muscle mass, but, you know, not, not, not too much body, body fat. Indeed. But on he top of that, better. like, like um, another factor to play into the entire, like, uh, first Diaz and Conor fight was, um, Conor McGregor was anticipating a fighting at lightweight anyway. He was planning on cutting down weight in the first yeah. place. I mean, fighting with another 15 pounds on you when you weren't expecting that, that could, yeah, uh, I mean, that could play I a big mean, difference. Gra- grab, a ba- grab a backpack, I mean, st- stuff 50 pounds in it and go for a run. You'll be exhausted. Oh, 100%. Hell, I just get exhausted carrying up like groceries that are like thirty pounds. I'm like, man, this is not the same as just walking up the stairs without yeah. anything. But many people don't realize how, how much weight cutting uh, disrupts your performance. Oh, that's a big dehydrator, man. Real big deal. <clears throat> Another thing that I wanted to talk about with you is, uh, what do you think about uh, rules that make no sense in the UFC? Because Another, another guy that uh, I really like to watch fighting, I don't like his personality, John Jones. Oh. His only loss is because the 12 to 6 elbow. Knew it! I knew it was going to be the 12 to 6 elbow. Rule. I hate that rule so much. I mean, if I throw an elbow like this, I really can't develop this, the same power if I throw it like this. And this is legal. You know what's weird about that rule? That rule is very interesting because it only seems to apply when you're on top. It always is. It does. Yeah. Like, have you seen Tony Ferguson? He's throwing if those from, your like, back, the bottom. It's, ni- it's nine to three. You know, it's nine to three. <laughs> it's, not, it's not 12 like, to six seriously. anymore. That- like, I think the pre- – like, I heard John McCarthy say, like, the reason that rule exists is one of the commissioners went to a karate tournament, and they saw, like, um, someone yeah, doing karate, bl- breaking lies. bricks, and just doing that. I'm like, Oh, come on. Ice doesn't fight back. No, but on the other hand, it's really easy to break those, those things because what they do, oh, yeah. the, the first one, the first one is way, uh, is way yeah, easier to break spacers. than the second and third one. And they leave a little bit of space with wooden sticks between the bricks. Mm-hmm. So if you hit the first one, that one is going to collapse and the shock wave and the weight comes down on the second one and then it's going to break in a row. It's just a trick. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, man. Like, I'd like to see someone break, like, all those blocks of ice without those sticks. No, see how hard that is. It's not going to be. Not, not. Try to break real cr- concrete. You know, real thick nope. concrete. It's not going <laughs> to. I'll break concrete with a hammer, but not with my elbow. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Give nope. me, like, a sledgehammer. I'll totally go the game on that. My elbow is going to lose. The game. My elbow is going to lose. But, I mean, that's the stupidest rule. But I have some more pet peeves in the, in the UFC, you know, when... Wanna watch, do you watch one championship once in a while? Uh, yep, I do. Once in a while, I watch it too. You know, it's not, most fighters aren't as, you know, as famous as UFC or Bellator fighters, so I don't watch it too much. Uh-huh. But I like the rule uh, from knees on the ground. I like it because it's a good rule. if you shoot for a double leg, it, you know, and your, both your knees are on the ground, it, you shouldn't be safe. I think if somebody can stop a double leg by kneeing you in the face, he shoot, he, it, it, it'll just another technique and you can't you can defend it if somebody throws knees from side control you can just throw your leg up you know and try to get him off of you or just block it it's it's not undefendable like so you know you know soccer kicks they don't take any technique and they are in my opinion too dangerous for combat sports because you kill somebody with it very easily because you, no, you're, talking, 100%. You're, not, you're not talking about regular human beings but you're basically talking about high level athletes so they can develop so much power in soccer kicks. So they should be stay illegal, in my opinion. But knees on the ground, I don't see, have a problem with that. I like them. 
No, I agree with you. Like, uh, I think it's kind of interesting that they don't allow, like, I think the rule about knees to a ground opponent is you're not allowed to go to the head. But I think that's yeah. kind of ridiculous because you can generate a lot more power by throwing knees from the clench to the head. You know, like, you yeah, have someone with a really tight clench, you just, like, drive your knee right up while pulling their head down. If someone's grounded and you're throwing knees, you're throwing it at an interesting angle where it's going yeah. more horizontal or downward. Yeah, totally. Like, you're throwing your knee totally up and pulling their head down. Like, yeah, dude, two that forces is colliding, yeah. Exactly. You know, but, but like, the thing is, it looks scary for some people, and that's why it's still illegal. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of agree with you on the soccer kicks. Don't get me wrong. I kind of like soccer kicks for one reason. It makes you appreciate not being in a bad position. It makes you actually have to defend yourself a bit. You're, you're, like, should if you, be if you spar to? with soccer kicks, your open guard will be so much better. Oh, yeah. Like, um, here's the one thing I don't like about soccer kicks, being on the receiving end of them. <laughs> Same. If, you're on, if you're on the receiving end of them, you totally appreciate, okay, this is a bad position. I should not be yeah. on my knees looking down. I should be on my back looking up. You yeah. got to face your problems. Like, if, you're, if you need to have the referee tell you, like, multiple times, Defend yourself, intelligently defend yourself. Why are you not defending yourself? That's the third kick. Yeah. Maybe you're doing something wrong. But I but like, like up, um, I like up kicks though. I like to see an up kick knockout. Oh uh, dude, those up kicks are, are slick. You, you you see the guys that you know grappled more that that don't grapple in MMA class, they just have a striking class, you know, kickboxing class, and then uh-huh. then they have a jiu-jitsu class or a wrestling class. If they fight you see it in in amateur MMA fights all the time. The, those guys you know, they they lean over their opponent if they are on the ground, you know. And they get, you know, they get up kicked in the face because they, they aren't expecting it because they don't spar with up kicks. And I think it's the stupidest, stupidest thing, in my opinion. It's because definitely a good thing to in train. Ju- in jiu-jitsu, you can lean over your opponent, you know, you keep your hips away, try to pass their guard. But you can't do that in MMA. You've got to lead with your hips. No, absolutely, man. Like, um you should never really lean over someone when you're standing over them in open guard. I've always trained to like be able to kind of sweep them from that position as well. Like the more forward they lean, the more ability you can kind of like tilt them over and kind of get a sweep off that. Yeah. But you but, also you know, never, a, you all should never give your opponent both your legs. I mean, you can, you know, if, oh no. if once you get a hold of their legs, if they're laying on their back and you know, and you put your knee, you know, you know what I mean? Like uh, you put one leg uh-huh. forward to jam their legs up. They can't develop power anymore. You keep their legs yeah. there. You can ground and pound them all day. But as soon as you give them your other leg, they can sweep you. They can go for a heel hook, knee bar, anything. Oh, absolutely, man. I love, what happened I love to, footbox, uh, man. That's what happened to Brock Lesnar. Ah, uh, dude, I love that heel hook. No, was it a heel knee hook? Knee bar. I think it was, it was a toe. Bar. No, it was a knee it bar wasn't. from... Uh, it was a knee it bar wasn't from... Wasn't uh, what was he called? He was in a really bad position, but he was able to roll into it and get that leg lock. It, it was yeah, very it, well It was played. a knee bar, I, I believe. I don't know. One way or the other, Frank Beer definitely pulled that well off. What was he called? What was the fighter called? It was like the heavyweight, very famous uh, jiu-jitsu guy. Wait, which one? Um... One second. It was against Frank Mir. Nice. You know, Frank Mir, they, they, he, he was on his back. Brock Lesnar stood over him, gave him both his legs, tried to, uh, you know, try to uh, throw some punches. Then Frank Mir just rolled for a knee bar and he submitted him. It was well played, man. Like, uh, that's something that Brock Lesnar was not expecting whatsoever, man. He was no. expecting to just walk in, get his um, win, and then just walk out. But yeah. he definitely walked into something more than he could anticipate. But that's Definitely the thing, kudos to him for that's like, the thing uh, with MMA. I mean, you, you can be winning, you know, throwing punches in, in somebody's guard, and all of a sudden you're getting triangled. triangled. Oh, yeah. If, they, if um, MMA has taught me anything, it's um, like uh, Anderson Silva versus Chael Sonnen won. Yeah. You can be getting your ass kicked for four, like uh, five out of five rounds, but that yeah. last minute could be the turning point. It's, it totally can. That's why MMA is, in my opinion, the most exciting sport in the world. Because you see boxing matches and, and football matches, and they are just, you know, they are just stalling for time, getting their points, and then they, you know, at, as you, you know already, if the match is halfway, not, not even halfway done, you know already was going to win. And in MMA, it can be 
all of a sudden, like you said, in the last minute, somebody can get knocked out or submitted. You never know. Oh, uh, actually, another example of that would be um, Antonio Bigfoot Silva versus Alistair Overeem. Overeem yeah. was winning that fight. He was starting to coast in the third round. He got caught once. Then he just got standing TKO'd against the fence. That was brutal, man. It was brutal. Like, like I was like really upset with that one because I actually put some money down on that. But I was like, oh yeah, Overeem's got this. He's gonna just knock him out in the second round. He didn't get the knockout in the second round. I'm like, okay, he's gonna get the knockout in the third round. And then you just see the collapsing of Overeem. Like, no, 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 no! Don't <laughs> stop the fight. They stop the fight. You know what? You know. I have always my top three, uh, top three things that uh, look the most painful for me in, in all of the MMA uh, fights that I've seen. I mean, Anderson Silva's leg. That shit was that shit was really really nasty to look at. That was that was a bad one. Pettis' body gig against Donald Cerrone. That was pretty bad as well. Not as gruesome, but it was felt. I could feel that one. Yeah, even I could feel. And and uh, the last fight from Paul Harris before he got banned from the UFC. He tore the guy's knee apart with a heel hook. Oh, okay. That and one, and yes. that's, that's why he got banned, because he held on to heel hooks for too long. Very unsportsmanlike. But can you imagine being in that position? You're tapping, you're already giving up, and that guy is, is just tearing your leg apart. Yeah, it's really interesting, because you don't expect that after so many fights, and Husamar Paul Harris being the, guy is just an asshole the professional crazy. he's supposed to be, you don't expect that he would understand what not only a tap is, but what a referee stoppage is. The referee yeah, was trying to pull him apart. The guy's just crazy. When he's in combat up. mode, he's just going to think about, I'm going to kill my opponent with everything I got. Yeah, it's a damn shame because I used to really like uh, Paul Harris. Like, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a leg lock fan myself. I'm me too. And he was, he was a leg lock master to me. And yeah. then I see him pulling this shit. I'm like, come on, man. You're making leg locks look really dangerous. They're, if you know your counters and you know how to be nice with them, yeah, you can feel some torque, but you know, if you just keep going and go past torque, you can feel their click in the rip. And it's really no, but, upsetting to see that. But, but the thing with leg locks is you can spar, we, we spar at my gym, we spar them all the time, but we learn the technique of, uh, you know, of position first. We, we know in which position oh, we are and we know how to control it before. We, we don't have to yank it to get the tap because we already have your leg. So you're not rolling out of it. If you roll, we just roll with you and then we slowly but surely start to submit you but it's not like it's the same with arm bars you can just yank an arm bar but if you have the control you don't need to no 100 percent. i agree with that wholeheartedly i, I the like thing, to do the catch and release thing myself yeah the thing and the thing with arm bars is uh the thing with arm bars is you can yank them before they break but if with heel hooks if you yank them somebody's knee is going to pop it's very true man i actually had a classmate I, um, I had a training buddy, classmate. He um, he had his leg screwed up pretty badly from a leg lock. It wasn't me, I promise. <laughs> totally guilt free on that one. I'm making like shit. Rams go and get it again, it injuring me. his t training mates. <laughs> no, no, no. The only people I injure is um, with their with their humor. I'm I constantly crack puns, and you know sometimes like Rand, stop. We get it. You crack puns. <laughs> but like um, one of my classmates, uh, he had his leg caught in a heel hook and. You know, he didn't spin quick enough, and uh, my other friend, he was doing the heel up to him. Yeah. And from across the room, I just hear this, like, pop. I'm like, oh, Jesus, get a room, you guys. <laughs> you know, I had that but with like, a guy that was doing, uh, you know, he, he wasn't training for competition. He was just training for fun. But he uh, used to really, he, he really uses a lot of steroids. You know, like a lot. Ah, uh, No bueno. But the thing is, he tore, he, he uh, popped his own knee because he was in, you know, in, in, in a lockdown, you know, half electric chair, we call it half electric uh -huh. chair or, you know, an Eddie Bravo lockdown. And yep. he used so much strength to get out of it. You know, he tried to, he tried to yank his leg out of it. The guy on bottom that had him in a lockdown uh, just felt his leg like, just felt his leg go pop. It was really, you know, the that whole gym, the whole gym turned around just so you, you can imagine how it sounded. But the uh, guy, the guy, oh, the guy on bottom was like, I wasn't even trying so hard, you know, I wasn't even putting that much pressure on his leg. But the guy on top, you know, the one that stair was, he just blew his own knee out because he put so much stress on his own knee. That that's also a thing that steroids do to you. You know, your body. I guess steroids didn't help that one. Nope, but you know, steroids they make you so strong in some 
and some things that you your own body can handle can't handle it. Yeah, I don't know. I, I had a cousin that used to do like steroids. No, I hundred percent agree. Thank God for you, Sada. All natural, man. Yeah, me too. Hash for you, Sada. Tag all natural. Don't do steroids, kids. Don't do steroids. <laughs> if you were a steroid absorber, Rance, <laughs> I don't want to fetch him you or anything, but. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> if you are a steroid, it wouldn't it wouldn't be a good commercial for steroids companies. No, no. I don't. Here's how I feel like um, if you have to do steroids to do something, you shouldn't be doing it. Yeah, but you like, know, I, I don't all care you need about to do is TRT. practice. I don't care about TRT, you know, or some steroids. If you do it for yourself, you like it. I mean, it's not healthy for you, but who am I to say that you can't do it? But if you do it in competition, you're hurting other people. Yeah. Actually, you know what? I've actually always talked about this with my friends in regards to, like, um, testing in USADA and everything. I actually came to this conclusion. There should just be two separate, like, um, tiers of fighters, the ones that do it all naturally. And then the ones that are like on TRT, you know, call them the Olympians and then the Titans. Yeah. I think that's that would totally level the playing field. Like, on the you other know, you hand, like, then maybe the competition isn't about who's more skillful, but it's who, who, who can deal with more steroids. I mean, true. But, you know, at least you have like your legitimate competitors and then you have like your free show fights. It's like, that's the same thing dude. I have with weight cutting. You know, I don't dislike weight cutting, but I kind of do because. It's sometimes it's, it's about a discipline. Who, who can make who can cut more weight, you know, without dying is the bigger guy is going to win. Sometimes. If he dies, he dies. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's the same with Conor McGregor. Would would he have been that successful if he if he didn't make it to that uh, he he never would be been the, the double champ if he had to fight at one seventy and one fifty five? No, he would not. No. I mean maybe he would. I give it a small no, margin that, that he would have. Uh, I, 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 but, um, I, I don't, uh, who was the champion at the time? Um, when he was featherweight champion, I believe it was Robbie Lawler. Yeah, I wouldn't see. I can't. Is either Johnny Hendricks or uh, Robbie Lawler? I could I be off I don't see lines. McGregor beating Robbie Lawler. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe. I mean, if it stays strictly standing, I could probably see that happening. But I don't see uh, McGregor like really handling the uh, durability of um, Rob yeah, Lawler too, too well. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it, it, it's like uh, Nick, Nick and Nate Diaz on steroids, <laughs> his durability. Pretty much. But to be fair, you know, I do have to give a little point away. I have to take a point away from Rob Lawler. He did get like really badly knocked out against uh, Tyron Woodley. The one time we see a flash knockout from T. Wood in UFC is like, bam, right there. No, he, he had some knockout, some knockdowns. Oh, indeed. Like, I don't know. I've never really considered um, Tyrone Woodley a very big, like, power puncher. Like, he definitely can lead himself into, like, these situations where he knocks people out. But to do that to Robbie Lawler in the first round, in the first, what was, like, very explosive. 